Lecture One, Introduction. Welcome. My name is John O'Malley, and it will be my privilege and pleasure to lead you through the history of the oldest living institution in the Western world, an institution that began 2,000 years ago and that is as vital today as perhaps ever in its history. I'm speaking, of course, of the papacy, and this is a course on that institution and on the men who held that office, some 260 of them, depending on how you count. It's a rich and fascinating story, but complex and sometimes confusing. So buckle your seat belts, and we can be on our way. In this introductory lecture, I want to do four things. First, say a few words in general about our topic, why should you bother? Secondly, tell you a few things to keep in mind if you want to get the most out of this series. Thirdly, jump into the subject by explaining the most important titles or names the popes and the papacy go by, such as Apostolic See, Vicar of Christ, and indeed the very word Pope itself. Fourthly, take a look at the role of Peter in the New Testament, reserving two crucial passages for the next lecture. So off we go. Our subject. Why bother? If you're interested in religion today, you have to be interested in the papacy. The popes are regularly on the front pages of our newspapers and John Paul II is sometimes spoken of as the man of the century, the man, the man of the 20th century. Catholicism is the largest single Christian church worldwide, and I don't think I have to tell any of you that religion as such is a vital reality in the world today, and it's a vital reality certainly in the United States. So this is an important subject for everybody. If you're a Roman Catholic, it's all the more important for you, as is obvious. That's if you're interested in religion. If you're interested in history, history of the Western world and even of the wider world, uh, this is not a story told in a sacristy. The popes were agents, somehow or other, in all the great dramas of the last 2,000 years. So this story of the papacy is kind of a, we can use it as sort of a window into the history of the West. Uh, just take the Basilica of St. Peter itself in Rome. Just think of all the important personages who at some point or other were there and for whom it was meaningful. It was built by the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century. That is the original Basilica. Geyseric the Vandal was there and started, tried to uh, vandalize it. Luther was there, Raphael, Michelangelo, Bramante, Bernini, Napoleon. Hitler and Mussolini visited it. Eisenhower, JFK, Nixon. Think of the role of John Paul II in the collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe. Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne in St. Peter's Basilica in the year 800. A thousand years later, Pope Pius VII crowned Napoleon at Notre Dame in Paris. If you're interested in the city of Rome, there's something in Rome for everybody. Remember that for 1,500 years, Rome was the Pope's city, the Trevi Fountain, Piazza Navona, the Sistine Ceiling, St. Peter's itself. And if you're interested in a darn good story, you'll find this one, I think, fascinating. The Popes, for instance, who were they? Greeks, Syrians, Spaniards, Frenchmen, Germans, one Englishman, one Pole. Sorry, no Irish, uh, no Scandinavians, no Slovaks or Hungarians, but the future's still open, right? Social background, former slaves like uh, Pope Callistus I, nobles like Pius XII, uh, peasant stock like John XXIII, working class like John Paul I, saints like Leo the Great and Gregory the Great, men of heroic stature, sinners like Pope Marcellinus, who in the persecution of the Emperor Diocletian apparently offered incense to the gods, or Pope John XII, who became Pope at the age of 18, and whose morally debauched life was a scandal even in the debauched Roman society of the 10th century. 
and you've certainly heard of the Borgias. Here are a few things to keep in mind if you want to get the most out of the course. First of all, remember, this is history. This is not theology. I'm not here to justify or to condemn the institution. I'm not here to justify or condemn the presuppositions upon which it is based. I am here to tell you how it got to be what it is. I am not here as well to justify or condemn the actions of the popes or the decisions they made. I leave all that up to you if you feel so inclined. The second thing to keep in mind is that uh, this is a history of the papacy. It is not a history of the Catholic Church. It's not a history of Catholicism. Uh, there are lots of actors on that stage. As a matter of fact, this course sort of distort one's view. In the modern world, in the contemporary world, we tend to think of Catholics as very identified with the papacy and with the popes. But uh, in the 13th century, for instance, I'd venture that maybe 2% of the population knew that there was such an institution or that it had anything very significant to do with their religion. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote his Summa Theologiae in the 13th century. It's three huge volumes when translated into English. The papacy is mentioned only in passing in that book. So we get a little distorted image if we think that identify this course with a history of the Catholic Church. It is not that at all. It's a history of one aspect, one segment, and an extremely important one, but it's not the whole reality. In that regard, it's also important for you not to be shocked. Uh, this is not always a pretty story. Yes, there were saints, but there are also sinners, or just most of them, just ordinary people like you and me, faced with big decisions, and their weaknesses tended to show because of the high responsibility that they bore. So please keep that in mind as we go through the course and along that line. Remember that the story gets very complicated because of the wealth of the Roman Church and its prestige. From the very beginning, devout Christians in and around Rome gave money to St. Peter. That is to say, they gave money to the Church of Rome. And they gave this in terms often of real estate. So that from the very earliest centuries, this was a wealthy see. Sometimes the popes did not have access to that wealth, but nonetheless it was there. This laid the basis for the formation of the papal states later, so that the pope became actually a temporal monarch. This made the institution often attractive to the wrong people for the wrong reason. And that's a great complication in the story of the history of this institution, as I know will become clear as we proceed through this series. The course, I'm afraid, can seem uh, something like uh, a course in crisis, just one crisis after another. After all, we're moving here with the speed of light through 2,000 years of history and perforce have to deal with crisis points. I just want to remind you that we're skipping over a lot of the serene periods when it was simply business as usual. So the posts were not always faced with a crisis situation. Moreover, you need to try to get rid of some of the presuppositions which I assume many of you have about what popes do and how they behave. Today, how do we look upon the papacy? What do popes do? The popes appoint bishops. They did not always do that. The popes write encyclicals. That's a modern development. The popes speak to huge crowds. That's a very modern development. How do the popes look upon their job in earlier ages? Well, some of their tasks simply to guard the tombs of Peter and Paul and of the martyrs in Rome, make sure that the great basilicas in Rome had dignified services, provide for orphans and widows and the needy in Rome, protect the city of Rome from foreign enemies, and rule the papal state. 
to be king and to be the maker of kings. So there's a change and a gradual development in how popes have understood their authority. In the earlier centuries, they acted like older brothers, warning, advising, occasionally ordering. They were treated with special respect. Their approval was wanted. And this approval was especially wanted in the Western world with Western bishops. Later centuries, they began to act in a more directive way, uh, taking the initiative and sending out directives and moving affairs from the top down, from a kind of a monarchical peak down the ladder of a hierarchy. Today, they're conceived, I think, in most people's minds, actually as kind of a CEO uh, with branch offices throughout the world. That's a very untraditional understanding of how the papacy operates. It's also important to remember that uh, many popes were not even priests when they were elected. Pope Leo X, for instance, was a deacon. Benedict VIII and Benedict IX were laymen when they were elected. Uh, remember that many popes were not elected in Rome. As late as the year 1800, Pope Pius VII was elected in the city of Venice. To ease us through this course, I want to make a point very early that, in my opinion, there are three critical moments in this history. The first is the year 65, around the year 65, when Peter and Paul were martyred in the city of Rome in the persecution of the Emperor Nero. On the martyrdom of Peter in Rome is based all the subsequent claims and history of the papacy. It's an absolutely crucial moment. The second moment is around the year 313 when Constantine tolerated Christianity officially and the church, as it said, emerged from the catacombs and became a public actor on the stage and began to assume more and more public and even civic responsibilities. This led to the founding of the Papal States. The next date is 1870 or 1929 when the city of Rome and the Papal State itself was seized by the leaders of the new kingdom of Italy and that aspect of the papacy came to an end. These are absolutely crucial points and if we keep those in mind we have a, sort of a very general roadmap for what lies ahead in this course. You might want to do some reading. Here are three books I would recommend. One is by Eamon Duffy, called Saints and Sinners, A History of the Papacy. Another by J. N. D. Kelly, The Oxford Dictionary of the Popes. And the last is The Papacy, an Encyclopedia, three volumes published by Routledge in New York in the year 2001.